Last year, we shot a video with four electric SUVs and a lot of you watched it, did pretty well. And I thought we should do a little bit of an update video as to, I would say, the hottest segment in the EV world, the small premium, you can call them crossover or small SUV segment. And we've assembled pretty much all of them. We're only missing one or two cars, which I'll discuss. And this is not gonna be the most crazy in-depth video, but I wanna take you through all of these cars, share all of my opinions about them because we get comments after comments every day about all of these cars right here and which should you buy. Well, today, hopefully we can help answer those questions. <laughs> So I think first, let's start with the cars that we've assembled. By the way, we came up with this idea at 5.30 p.m. yesterday. It's currently the next morning. So uh, I don't know how we were able to assemble all of these cars, but I'm glad that we did. Uh, we have the Audi Q4 e-tron, and that's what really sparked this whole video was this is one of the first ones in the country. It just arrived at our local dealer, Ed Carroll, here in Fort Collins, Colorado, and can't thank them enough for their support for letting us borrow this on a Sunday. They're closed today, and they're like, ah, oh, take the Q4 and do what you want with it. So we're going to do all the range tests, charging tests, all the stuff we really uh, uh, want to do. But I'll tell you a little bit about the cars as we go down the line. So a brief introduction to them, then I'll get into the pricing and then we'll, more. So Q4 e-tron 50 all-wheel drive. This is the top spec driveline, although I think it's actually the only one you can order. Originally Audi USA said they're going to bring the rear-wheel drive version, 150 kilowatt motor, same as ID4. It's built on the same MEB chassis, and it just um, didn't show up on the website recently. So all of the ones that I think are rolling in right now, at least in America, are the big battery all-wheel drive. So it's about a 82 kilowatt hour gross, 77 usable-ish and seemingly a great drivetrain. This one has the newer software. We're gonna do the charging test on it. Should do 135 kilowatt peak. I think Audi claims 125. We'll have to play around with it and see. But overall, basically just an ID4 updated styling, but then less basic features. For example, this one doesn't even have adaptive cruise control or massaging seats, all of which well, adaptive cruise control and lane centering are available as standard in ID4. So we got to get into the value stuff later on, but should be a nicer ID4, but you really got to spec it up to get there. This is really the benchmark in the class, the Tesla Model Y. We see them everywhere. It's one of the most popular cars on sale and for good reason. You have the best charging network. You have one of the best drive lines ever and just an awesome car. The most expensive car standard price here though. Do you know these things are like 66 grand now? What the heck is going on at Tesla? This car, new, this is an older one, was like 52 or 53,000. This same car today is more than $10,000 more, but that's just the way things are going. Then we have one of my favorites, the Hyundai Ioniq 5, built on the electric global modular platform eGMP and uh, basically a sister car of the Genesis GV60 and Kia EV6, really cool car. Next generation tech available today is how I would describe it. Really looks futuristic. I, I love everything about this car. I think it's so cool. And uh, the price is reasonable, range is good. And then the charging speeds is where this thing is just an absolute monster. And again, we'll break all this down. Then we have the Ford Mustang Mach-E. This example here is actually the GT Performance Edition. So it looks really spicy but uh, you can option it all the way down with a smaller battery pack, et cetera. This one looks amazing in grabber blue with the big wheels and everything. But if we really were to compare it with the rest of the trims here, we wouldn't have a GT Performance. Um, we'd have a, you know, a premium or a select, a, a more entry-level trim, but it's just what we had access to, and we're gonna use this to at least talk about the Mach-E overall. Then we have the Volkswagen ID4. Love this car, and I'll explain why throughout the video, but uh, just very reasonably priced. Now starting with localized production in Chattanooga, we'll have a US built ID4 with the smaller battery pack and the larger battery pack. This one is big battery, all wheel drive. So again, same as Q4 e-tron, 82 kilowatt hour gross, 77 usable. Uh, all wheel drive, about 300 horsepower in this thing, and it's just priced so well and that's where this car wins and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well this is the kia ev6 the sister car to the hyundai ionic 5 underneath identical this is the ev6 wind 
trim. And so, you know, not totally maxed out. Same with the Ionic 5, that's the SEL. So very comparable specs. And uh, again, 800 volt system architecture, crazy fast, 235 kilowatt charging, just a great road tripper. And the thing is, I don't want this video to be, here's the car you should buy, or this is the best car I should say. I think these can all be the best cars given your specific scenario and, and your wish list. So the goal here is to explain which one of these cars can fit into a specific type of lifestyle more than one just being the best. And so I think we should start by talking about price on all of them. Then we'll get into range, of course, the charging times. Then maybe we'll take each one just for a quick drive around the block. And then I'll share the final, my final opinions. We'll talk, we'll just take you on a tour of all of them. So long video, but uh, man, how cool is it that we have all these things together? I'm psyched to show you them. I wanna say a huge thank you to Chesapeake Climate Action Network Action Fund for sponsoring today's video. Now we've highlighted this organization all summer and they are doing some incredible work in the fight against climate change. They are actually giving away a Tesla Model S Plaid or Model X Plaid, $135,000 worth of Tesla credits or a Rivian R1T. All you have to do is go to evraffle.org. It's a $200 ticket and that can earn your chance to win one of these vehicles. The cool thing is, is actually they're undersold a little bit too. So they have about 2000 tickets left to go. They've sold about 3,500. And that means if you want to earn a Tesla Model S Plaid like this one, maybe slightly less damaged, <laughs> you can go and actually buy a ticket right away. I would suggest doing so. I don't think your odds will ever be better in winning a Tesla Model S or X Plaid or a Rivian R1T. By the way, the Rivian R1T is actually in their garage and ready for immediate delivery. So head to EV raffle.org thanks to chesapeake climate action network action fund for sponsoring today's video so before we get into price i think it's important to explain why we chose these specific suvs cuvs what the heck are they i don't know jordan what do you think CUV. i mean like is the kia ev6 an suv they say it is on the website it looks more like a hatchback to me but i don't know that's just we're blending the lines of vehicle classes these days i've i've opened up my phone here because i want to at least mention a few different things there's two other suv comparisons i'd like to do soon the first is sort of the entry level suv electric comparisons uh, which would be like kona nero bz4x solterra mx30 uh, bolt euv for example and the bolt euv actually just uh, is a great value. So all of these cars are quite expensive um, and you kind of need to factor in tax credits, which is a whole disaster right now going in the US to figure out if you qualify, when do you take delivery, what cars go into the next one. The thing with the Chevy Bolt EUV, I just want to mention, the things, what is it, $28,000 starting price? And that's like you, no tax credits, that's just the price of the car. That's a really good value. So if you don't need all-wheel drive, if you don't need premium features, you can actually option Super Cruise on a nice one of those too, if you get the Premier. Uh, that's just like right off the bat, price-wise, I would consider that. This is really the next level up in terms of fit and finish and quality. The other video I would like to do is sort of the luxury SUVs. We're talking I-Pace, Model X, BMW iX, and full-size e-tron. Um, those used are starting to creep into these new price range. Uh, and that could be an interesting scenario as well. If you're looking at, for example, we bought a used Audi e-tron full-size, which is bleh, it's a bit more expensive than these still, but you're not too far off and that it might be a great option for you as well. Um, other notable mentions of three cars we couldn't get today in this lineup and they're all built on Volvo's CMA platform, XC40 Recharge, C40 and Polestar 2. Those are um, I think very worthy competitors here. Again we couldn't get those cars just in time. We tried, we called everyone we knew with these things, just couldn't get one. XC40 Recharge really would have been my preference to have in this lineup. And I think it would have done very well. And I think I'll start off the bat. It's quite expensive. It's in the mid to high 50s, 58,000, maybe 60 grand if you get the nice one. 400 horsepower, 78 kilowatt hour battery pack, very inefficient, only 225-ish miles of range in our testing. So good option, Swede speed, rips, 
but um, yeah, definitely a, a very worthy competitor here. It's not the best charging and it's not the fastest, or I should say the most efficient car, but it is quite fast. So let's walk down the line. And I think we should start at the least expensive car and work our way up. What do you think, Jordan? Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, so that brings us to the Volkswagen ID4. And I have been a huge fan of the Volkswagen ID4, but it, they, there are some problems. First of all, I think Volkswagen Group in general is just having the hardest time with software. What is going on over there with Cariad? I don't know. Dies is leaving. Oliver Bloom's coming in. It's kind of a disaster over at Volkswagen Group when it comes to software, and this car sort of embodies that. Early on, they were buggy. Um, we have a family member who owns one who had like major software glitches. Software 3.1 should fix everything. This car has software 3.1 because it's a new delivery, but we haven't heard of any existing ones being updated yet, and certainly not updated over the air. So that's this car's Achilles heel. Where it's good at is kind of everything else. And the software thing wouldn't stop me from buying one. It wouldn't, you know, I'm just letting you know up front, like a little bit slow to respond from times. I actually like the software uh, UI, how you operate it in this car quite well. So pricing wise, this is where it gets real, real special. The localized production standard range ID4, which will be available later this year, again, these videos have a long shelf life, will be $37,495. I believe if you were to order one and lock into order, I don't know if Volkswagen's allowing this, you can still qualify for the $7,500 tax credit, which is not cash on the hood, you know, that comes out of your tax liability. It's technically like under $30,000, which is insane. If you were to go for the larger battery pack, and we'll do all the testing on the different batteries and the charging curves and everything like that, um, you get the 82 kilowatt hour battery pack. So it's 77 usable versus 58 kilowatt hours usable. Pretty much everyone's gonna go for the big battery pack, I think, at least for now, because the small battery pack's not available in the US. Um, you're basically into this thing for low 40s. If you want all wheel drive, it's 46,295. And that's what this car is. This is the base spec, all wheel drive package. I think a great, fantastic package. Volkswagen just redid a lot of their model trims. They now go Pro, Pro S, and then Pro S something, Pro S Premium, Pro S Select. What is it? Pro S Plus. Okay, so anyway, you can spec them how you want. They have all new wheels for the new model year. They look pretty good and we'll do more on this. But in terms of price, this is by far, without question, the best value here in the lineup in terms of having a very premium feeling car, the suspension, the accelerator pedal, it drives really nice. I love the seating position and it's just a car to get you from A to B and it puts a smile on your face. It has some personality. I really enjoy it. Volkswagen ID4 wins on price without question. Next cheapest version here is actually the Hyundai Ioniq 5, believe it or not. Next generation tech for under $40,000 if you go with the small battery pack. Those are pretty hard to find SE standard range and I've never actually tested one because we can't find anyone with one. But my dad has actually seen one in a dealership, so we know they exist and you could get one. And that is pretty cool. So $39,950, under 40 grand before tax credits for this awesome looking car. Again, that would be the rear wheel drive, smaller battery pack, which is in the 50 kilowatt hour range. Yeah, it's 50 something trying to think about what it would be. 58 kilowatt hour, not sure if that's gross or usable. Hyundai doesn't actually say. So that would be a good value. This particular one uh, is in the low $50,000 range, SEL with all wheel drive, 77.4 kilowatt hour pack. So the range again is about 40 to 55,000 for this car. Next cheapest is the EV6. Again, same situation. They call it the light, I believe, standard range. And this is, uh, again, 58 kilowatt hour rear wheel drive, just a couple hundred dollars more than the Ionic 5. And what's going on with that? Didn't Kia used to be like the worst brand to Hyundai? Not anymore. It's really like the sporty ones versus the everyday ones. I don't know. Um, yeah, personally, I think for the money, Ionic 5 is probably the way to go, but we can talk a little bit more about that too. Uh, EV6 Lite starts at 41,000. The big battery rear wheel drive starts at 47,000 and the cheapest all wheel drives 51,400. 
Next up would be the Mustang Mach-E in select form, which has the worst wheels you've ever seen in your life on a car. I, like a base, this Mach-E looks stellar. A base Mach-E looks terrible, <laughs> really bad, full rental car spec. So then you got to spend a little bit of money and option up to the, the premium or the California Route 1, which is the range version. And there's two different battery packs available in Mustang Mach-E as well. Uh, usable battery packs around 70 kilowatt hour base. And then the big battery pack, which this car has, is around 91 kilowatt hours. And... Um, but what Mach-E wins on though is total range. This car with the standard battery pack has almost the same range as this Ionic 5 all-wheel drive with the big battery. So 247 miles EPA standard battery pack, that's pretty impressive. And these things do have great range. So if range is really important to you, it would be fun to do a range test with it. I bet the Mach-E goes the farthest out of any of these here. So that could be a thing. Uh, built in Mexico, but from an American automaker. Some people like driving an American car. And other than Tesla, I think it's actually, yep, the only American automaker here in the segment. So we're looking forward to Chevy Blazer, Stellantis, at least in America, is asleep at the wheel. In Europe, they're outselling everyone. But yeah, need, need some more American stuff coming here. That'd be kind of cool. Next cheapest, surprisingly, is the Audi, which would be the most premium brand here. And that is the Q4 e-tron. And um, they claim 53, excuse me, but the rear wheel drive will be priced at 43,900 base. I haven't seen any come into the US yet. This one's 53 and a bit, a little bit more than that, but basically the trims right now go prestige, no, prestige is max, premium, is then the base and then there's a premium s in the middle something like that 52 you can say you can talk 57, 57 is this spec right. with destination and all the options and no adaptive cruise. right no adaptive cruise on this one but basically more expensive for less equipment than the id4 but same drive line you know you can go in the configurators and spec your exact spec but to me in terms of value not seeing it with the Q4 right now. I also don't know how many they plan to bring to America. I really think ID4 is going to be Volkswagen Group's volume electric SUV. But um, yeah, kind of a, an odd looking thing. And then surprisingly, this is the most expensive car here. The one that everyone says is the best. You have to get a Tesla. It's like the coolest thing ever. This thing's $66,000 right now in the configurator, which is just ludicrous for a base Model Y. Now, granted, you do get the big battery pack, 82-ish kilowatt hour. You do get access to the best charging network. You do have an amazing drivetrain. They do rip. They handle really well. But it's a lot more money, $20,000 more than the rest of these in the base configuration. Again, this one in the rear-wheel drive trim is 44000 This is twenty grand more for the next cheapest Model Y. So I don't understand why... Um, so many people, I guess there's this notion that if you don't buy a Tesla, you're not cool or you're not supporting the mission. I don't know. It's so expensive to drive this car right now. No question. The numbers are right there. So a lot of people can't jump in and spend the extra money into a Model Y. If you do though, I think you'll have a great ownership experience. I own two Teslas. I love them. They're amazing. But to all the Tesla people watching this video, you gotta realize all of these other cars are a significantly better value than this car right off the bat when you look at sheer numbers on paper. So that puts this car at a massive disadvantage there. And we'll get into its advantages later on. So just to remind you, wrap up on the pricing, the cheapest is the ID4. Next up comes the Ionic 5, then the EV6, then the Mustang Mach-E. Those are all really, and including if you can find a rear wheel drive Q4, these are all really in that high 30s to low $40,000 base price. Most of them are optioned into the high 40s, low 50s for the volume models. And then you have the outlier here, which is the Tesla Model Y, which is quite a bit more expensive. So there's the pricing differences between all of these cars. So range is the hot topic with a lot of new EV drivers. And I think we can all sort of agree the more, holy smokes, an XC40 recharge just pulled up in Sage Green right there. Can we borrow your car? Beautiful. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyway, that's the least amount of range. Anyway, it's 223 miles EPA. Um, so yeah, we can use an XC40 recharge. We'll just have to really zoom in. <laughs> so here's the deal. Um, 
range to a lot of new EV owners is the hot topic. As soon as you live with one for like a couple of weeks, you go like, oh, everything has got more than enough range. As long as you can go a couple hundred miles usable in all conditions and find charging stations along your long route, then that's great. For me, certain people, range is a really hot topic, which is why we're talking about it. But just, I think if you're a prospective EV buyer, 99% of trips of people that I know are typically around town, daily driving, and then they go on a long trip once in a while. And that's when like usually two in the US, two or 300 miles is like one of the many legs of the trip you're going to do. And so it's all about recharging time and things like that. So um, total range, not the hottest topic for me anymore, but for a lot of people, you need it to feel confident. And if you look at numbers on paper, the Tesla Model Y has the highest range out of all of these cars uh, with 330 miles in this configuration. Big battery, aero wheels. If you get the big wheels on Model Y, it drops the EPA down to, I think, 318 miles. And then the performance, I think, is just about 303 miles. So Again, each configuration will be a little different. We're talking maximum range you can configure all these cars in in the American market under the EPA cycle, and Tesla's rated at 330 miles. That doesn't necessarily mean that in the real world this will go the farthest compared to Mustang Mach-E, which is the next at 314 miles in the California Route 1. That would be an interesting range test is to run both cars side by side. Again, the range testing can be done in a few different ways. There's a few different test methods, and that means that there's room for variability. So the number that the advert, the, excuse me, the number that the automakers have to advertise, they put on the label, they put on their website, is an independent test done by laboratories or sometimes by automakers, but submitted to the government for final approval with their test data through the EPA. It doesn't necessarily represent all cars in the same conditions going the same distance. There's a two cycle, there's a three cycle that goes to 50% where they offboard drain the battery. I know getting really complicated. And then there's a five cycle and each of these cars have been driven a little bit differently in these cycles. So highest number on paper, not sure that translates to the real world. We can do that test at some point. Next up is, of course, 314 miles EPA in the Mustang Mach-E. That, I truly believe, is more real world uh, of an application because Mach-E's, every time I drive them, just never stop going. They just go and go and go in almost all of the configurations especially the California Route 1. I took one over the Rockies from here in Fort Collins to Glenwood Springs once. It was like through 280 miles and I still had like 20% remaining. Like it was, that's eh, over the Rockies. It did so well, really well. Next up on the list, forgive me for rents referencing my notes, is the EV6. And EV6 and Ionic 5 have the identical drivetrains. So this is big battery, rear wheel drive gets this, and it's 310 miles EPA in this particular car. What's interesting about both this and the Ionic 5 is when you select all wheel drive, you lose like 50 miles of EPA range. Now we've never actually had the chance to run the rear wheel drive and the all wheel drive back to back. I bet in the real world, it's not that big of a difference. You see, what's kind of cool is in the all wheel drive trims, they'll physically disconnect the front motor with a clutch disconnect to give you the same, basically same drive line as just the rear wheel drive cars. And um, I don't know how the EPA testing uh, works with all of this. So that's a whole nother video in and of itself. At least numbers on paper, the rear wheel drives go really far. The all wheel drive cars are in that 250 ish 256 miles, somewhere around there, EPA range. So a massive drop for all wheel drive. And I promise we'll get to the test one day to prove if that's actually true in the real world. Then the Ionic 5 is the next longest range at 303 miles EPA. The reason I think that this is a little bit less than the EV6 with the same driveline is just the shape. The aerodynamic profile takes a little bit of a toll on this, a little bit different wheels, but it's a much taller car. It's pushing a lot more air out of the way. And we've even found in our own testing for that to be true. Same test loop, this goes a little bit less far than the EV6 uh, all wheel drive did. Next up, surprisingly, Volkswagen ID4. This was just updated for this year. So they did some adaptation, some changes. And so now 275 miles in the EPA cycle. That's pretty good. Uh, that's for the, again, the big battery rear wheel drive. Maybe you're getting a theme. The less motors you have, the longer range it goes. The only one who's proven that wrong is Tesla because their all wheel drive one is the farthest one. So 
you know, that's kind of interesting. But 275 miles in the 77 kilowatt hour usable pack with the 150 kilowatt rear motor. Then next up would be the Q4 e-tron which is the least amount of range here. And I think the reason is, again, built on the same platform as the ID4, is you can't spec, or at least it's not been EPA rated, the rear wheel drive version of this car yet. Now, this has been a little bit confusing to me today because we've referenced the price as rear wheel drive, but not the range. And so at least for now, I think we have to go with this just being the all wheel drive available trim and it's 241, 242 miles EPA, which is very similar to the ID4 all wheel drive. So uh, yeah, I would say they all go far enough. That's the real thing here is if you really drove one back to back, does the range difference between any vehicle in this segment, and I mentioned the XC40 recharge only having 223 miles EPA, with the big battery configurations on all these cars, my impression is they all go far enough. The range differences between any of these wouldn't be a buying decision deal breaker for me. And the thing is, wintertime affects range, summertime affects range, elevation affects range, towing. And so there's so many external factors here that in the real world, it'd be kind of fun one day to run them all you know, on the same loop. They, they all go about the same and it's not gonna impact your, your daily driving one way or another. Now, some of you might comment, I have a 302 mile commute so I could do it with 303 miles in the Ionic 5. No, not really possible. You're never gonna get that number on the paper driving normally. You usually have to drive in a mixed loop of very slow speed with a little bit of back road driving, a little bit of highway, they're mixed drive cycles. And so, yeah range isn't going to make the, the buying difference, buying decision difference to me, but I'll tell you what will, and that's charging. This is where the cars really show who's going to basically win this thing or not, in my opinion. And that is really only if you're going on long trips. Again, most people will drive around their town, around their home, commuting to their office 99% of the time. And maybe two or three times a year, you'll go on a trip probably not cross country, probably just a few hundred miles here or there. So then charging doesn't even really matter because all of these cars charge fast enough to do the occasional trip. I know some of you are like me, which means you just spend all of your time in the car, driving cross country, doing big trips at DC chargers all the time. And that's where included charging plans come into play. And that's where charging speeds come into play. So I'm gonna walk you down the line and explain the charging strategy for each of these. And one notably has a huge advantage as to the networks they can use. You join me over here at the big red Model Y. And this is where this car just hands down wins every time is charging. Tesla has just built the most amazing charging network. They deserve all the credit for it. And um, they've built these superchargers all across the country, all across the world. And I, I've been using them for a long time. I've been using the public charging networks for a long time. And by far the supercharger network is the most robust, the easiest to use, the nicest connector, the quickest to start charging. And this is the only car today that can take advantage of it in our market. Now, just a little bit of background. In Europe, Tesla is actually opening up the supercharger slowly at select stations for others to use. And I have a whole video on that. And it is pretty seamless and it's great. And that takes the Tesla advantage away a little bit. But at least for today, in summer of 2022, we can't use Tesla superchargers with anything other than a Tesla. And that means that if you're gonna be doing a lot of road trips, if you don't have home charging and you have to rely on public infrastructure, this will be the most seamless experience without question. I don't think anyone could argue that. You roll up to a supercharger, the car warms up the battery pack so you get the fastest charging with battery preconditioning. It tells you where to go. If the supercharger's full, by the way, it'll even route you to another one that's less full because it knows how many people are there. You back into the supercharger, you plug it in and you walk away. So it has everything you need. You need on route battery preconditioning. You need really good route planning and this does the best. It tells you where to go. It not only tells you where to go on your trip, but again, factors in the use times of the chargers. And then it has plug in charge where it just bills your credit card by charging. So great. In terms of charging speed, 250 kilowatt max. It's not always just about the peak number. It's about the curve. 
and that's where this car isn't so great. It can only do 250 kilowatts from roughly 5% to 30, 35% at the highest, and then it starts to come off of its peak. So in order to optimize your charging times, you really have to run this thing all the way out, all the way down. And that's what Tesla recommends. The car will help you get there too with, on, with the route planning. It gets you to superchargers pretty low. Um, but you're not going to get that great fast charging up top, unlike the Ionic 5. But I just thought it was a, a real key distinction that some people will just have to buy the Tesla purely because of the charging network. Another key advantage to the Model Y is you can actually use the public networks as well. CCS adapters are currently available in the aftermarket. Tesla should be offering it factory, but I have one personally, and it's really the key vehicle to uh, go on trips with because you can use all of the Electrify America stations, all of the charge point, all the EV goes, and all of the superchargers. And it's actually become a little bit handy because I was driving through Las Vegas on a trip recently in, in a Model S and all of the superchargers were full and I used my CCS adapter at a CCS station, an Electrify America station. I took the last spot there, no one was waiting so I didn't block anyone and got 210 kilowatts rather than waiting in line with a Tesla. That is the problem with all of these cars. It's not unique to Tesla. The, the number of EVs being sold is not matching the number of charging stations being built and lines are starting to form and it's really a massive problem. So this by far easiest charging experience, not the fastest, but the easiest. Let's talk about the Ionic 5 because this is this and the EV6 are pretty much the same. The only difference comes with their free charging plans, the included charging, but this is really the charging monster here. If you're comfortable using the public charging networks, which are a little bit more cumbersome, aren't as reliable, and there aren't as many of them as superchargers, then this is the car for you. And actually, it's probably the car I would choose in terms of a road trip and charging because this is just an absolute animal when it comes to charging. 235 kilowatt peak. I think I've seen actually 242 kilowatts delivered to it max. Really rips the speed. Uh, 10 to 80% Hyundai claims in 18 minutes. We've been able to match that many times. But again, this is like expert level car. In order to reach those charging speeds and to get them, A, you need to figure out the public networks, but B, it requires the battery pack to be in the optimum temperature range, which this car does nothing to help you with getting there. So there's no on-route battery preconditioning, there's no on-route uh, route planning, and there's no plug-in charge. So it's really like a, you know, if you're a photographer and you use manual modes and dial in all of your settings, this is the car for you because you have to control everything. The car is not going to do anything to help you to get that fast charging speeds, but if you can get it right, it's just awesome. And so for me, it's a fun game to be like middle of winter. We're getting to an Electrify America station. I have 10% left in the battery pack. You got to yo-yo the car, drive the crap out of it, try and spike heat into the system, and then you can get fast charging. But if you're just a general driver, both this and EV6, you'll be lucky if you see 240 kilowatts that often, unless it's summertime, which then it actually overheats itself and can't keep itself cool at high charging power. So again, the fastest charging car here, but requires a bit of a manual mode. The EV6 is the same problems as, as the Ionic 5, no plug and charge, no route planning, and no battery preconditioning. And both come with different plans at Electrify America for fast charging. This car comes with three years or two years two years of 30 minute fast charging sessions for free. Very rarely will you ever be at one for more than 30 minutes unless it's middle of winter when they charge really slow and you didn't warm up the battery pack. Um, and then you can just unplug and plug back in is my understanding and get, get another session, which I believe is how it works. I think they want you to wait an hour, but I'm pretty sure it works if you just unplug and plug in. That's not me giving you advice to do that. That's just me letting you know that it works. Um, and so, so this is the cheapest EV here in terms of uh, fast charging in the fast charging category. I don't actually remember what the EV6 gives you. Thousand, thousand kilowatt hours. Oh, really? So it gives you one megawatt hour. <laughs> so that you'll burn through that in like a weekend on a road trip. So I, w I mean, that's like $250 worth of free electricity in the EV6. Rather than a time limitation, they give you one megawatt hour of free electricity. So that's, you know, at least 12 or 13 charging sessions, deep charging sessions. For most people, that will last years if you don't road trip very often. My dad wanted me to mention that the GV60 gets three years of 30 minute sessions, right dad? Yes, sir. Okay, same as Ionic 5. No, 
That's two years. Oh, two years. GV60 is three years. Nice. Same as ID4 then. <laughs> so since we're talking ID4, let's talk Mustang Mach-E. Mustang Mach-E <laughs> is the next fastest charging EV, and it has a very weird charging strategy, but it works. First of all, it does great route planning, Mustang Mach-E. It's good for the novice driver. Now, when I get in this car and I'm a nerd and I want to optimize everything, I ignore it and I run this battery all the way out. But if you own a Mustang Mach-E, it's going to get you to the stations with enough charge buffer. Then when you get to the station, it'll be the Tesla experience. You roll up to Electrify America, you plug it in and you walk away and there's plug-in charge. Except you're never going to do that because when you use plug-in charge on the Mustang Mach-E, you get billed at the rack rate for electricity, which is like 42, 43 cents per kilowatt hour. In order to get the Pass Plus membership, by the way, I think Ford gives you 250 kilowatt hours for free in this car, which you burn through in a weekend. doesn't really matter. Um, the thing is, when you want to use plug-in charge, there's no way to link up your Electrify America Pass Plus, which every EV driver should have, in my opinion. One charging session a month pays for itself. It's $4 per month. You buy down your electricity to 31, 32 cents a kilowatt hour. And it's impossible today, and for the last year and a half, Mustang Mach-E has been on sale, to link that with your plug-in charge account. So even though this car is capable of it, you'll never use it because why spend an extra sometimes $20 a charging session when you can just swipe on your app. It's really not that hard, but we're getting there. This is the Volkswagen ID4, and it's the same as the Q4 e-tron. I don't know what the Q4 e-tron's free charging plan is, but I'm pretty sure it's comparable. This will give you three years of 30 minute free DC fast charging. You will likely stay at charging stations more than 30 minutes in this car if you do deep charges. And its peak charging rate is the lowest here. Whereas this car does 240 kilowatts and it holds it by the way, all the way to basically 70, 75%. This thing rips the charging. This will peak at 135 kilowatts on the new software for the US market. And it tapers at like 40%. So <laughs> not the fastest DC fast charger. I would say this is probably the slowest acceptable DC fast charging profile on the market today. It's still totally doable. I would still recommend the car. If you do a ton of road tripping though, spend a little bit more money, get an EV6 and just manual mode it and you'll be great. No amazing route planning in this car. It's better on the newer software, but from what I've been playing around with, it's not perfect. Plug and charge is now finally a thing and it's here. So you should be able just to back in, plug in and walk away, which is great. And, um, yeah, so battery preconditioning still not, not the best for winter time, but it doesn't charge that fast, so the battery doesn't need to be red hot to get great charging speeds, so not, not as big of a deal with this car. If you do a ton of road tripping, wouldn't recommend it, but if you, again, if you're doing the occasional trip a few times a year, more than acceptable to drive this across the country. The Bolt EUV that I mentioned, by the way, only charges at 55 kilowatts. It's the cheapest, you know, best new car value on the market, I think. Um, but this still charges more than twice as fast, 135 kilowatts. I don't think I mentioned the charging speeds of the Mach-E, but I've seen a peak of about 168, 170 kilowatts. It's rated for 150. And it gives you a five to 10 minute boost of max power and then it falls off. So it, they'll always try and give you everything the car can take when you plug in, and then don't expect to charge this car past 80%. Um, you've heard me mention maybe in previous videos that this will drop to 12 kilowatts at 80%. That has now been moved to 90%, but still 80 to 90 is very slow, aggravatingly slow. We're talking 40 kilowatts around there. And um, Ford just really doesn't want their customers to fast charge the top of their battery packs. It is the hardest on them, um, but that's, kind of a rough strategy. Again, big range and deep charges is the way to drive this car. So you, you go up to 80% at a charger and then you do big distances. Whereas maybe in the ID4, you're only charging to 45, 50% and then stretching it to the next one to optimize speed on road trips. And um, yeah, so basically to break it down for you, if you want the supercharger network, you only have one option. It's the Tesla Model Y, a fantastic option. And that's why you spend the money for that car. To me, you don't spend the money on a Tesla for the build quality or the looks. You spend it for the infrastructure, the app, the vertical integration, and that's where the money's going in the Model Y. If you want the fastest possible charging, you go Ionic 5, EV6, or Genesis GV60. Those are just wicked fast. If you want 
a long range, easy to operate charging strategy, you go Mustang Mach-E. And if you want sort of everyday usability, free charging for three years, then ID4 or Q4 e-tron. So there you go, that's the charging speed. It's to me the biggest differentiation between all of the cars. And uh, that's why I would personally, if I had to choose one, which is not, that's not the point of this video, but if I had to choose one, it would be the Ionic 5 because it looks the coolest and uh, yeah, charges the fastest. All right, so hi everyone. My name is Dave, I'm Kyle's dad, and I um, am here today to help out. I guess I got selected because I'm the big guy, right? The guy who's six foot five, what do I get to test? I get to test the headroom. I get to test the rear seat room, and I'm gonna test a few other things along the way. So let's take a ride here with me and a stationary ride in the Audi Q4 e-tron. Now, I have set each one of these seats already in the in this position that I need the, the seat to be in. And I've got plenty of headroom. And when I shut the, when I shut the door, doors, you know, it closes nice. And, and uh, well, the first thing I notice about this car is it has four window switches. For all those people that have complained for a long time about the ID4 only having two window switches and, Guess what? It's probably worth the extra money just for the for the four extra two window switches. The UI in this car, in my opinion, is um, it says continue as a guest here. It's much snappier than the ID4, and I've owned three ID4s. I played around with this a little bit. It's better, but uh, I'm not really I'm not really uh, I, I'm still leaning towards uh, you know having my judgment um, after a little bit more time with this. The the app that I have on my iPhone, I can say I haven't used it yet for this e-tron, but I'm hoping it's better than my experience with the ID4. Um, the app on the ID4, I'll talk about that, was not good. So a um, couple things that are interesting to me about this car. This is a $57,000 car list and it's a base car and it doesn't have power tilt and telescopic. Not a big deal if you're the single driver, but if you're gonna have memory seats and you're gonna have two or three drivers in the household, you're gonna to have to adjust the steering wheel every single time you get in and out of the car. So let me jump into the back seat and see how the headroom or leg room is here. Remember, I'm 6'5", and I'm, and I'm leaving the, the seat right where it is. And... Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, ow, okay, that hurt, actually. There's a cup holder back here, which is kind of nice. Um, headroom, I'm wedged. Literally, if I sit up straight, it's not good. This seat does not angle back at all. I'm a little wide as well. I know that's a different topic, but um, look, you know, this is an extreme example. I'm six foot five sitting in the back here. If I, if this were an Uber picking me up and I had my Uber driver at six five, he wouldn't get a tip. I, I'm here, but it's not great. Let's jump to the next car. All right, so Model Y. Love the car. We've owned Model 3s, Model Ys, Teslas, they're great. I do not like the door handles on the Model 3s and Ys. I will say that. Uh, I, I sit up a little high in this car, uh, but I will say that the glass roof comes very far forward. It has a very open feel and you know, of course, obviously this is, this is the minimalist dream for the UI. Um, arguably, if you're okay not having buttons, nothing better. The whole fact that you don't have anything in front of you, um, there's no heads up display in this car. Uh, that, you know, you gotta look over here in the top left of the, I, you get used to it, you really do. No big deal, don't overthink it. Um, the steering wheel does go up and down, in and out. You have to use these buttons to do that. So, um, you know, as far as sitting in the car, you got four window switches, plenty of room. You do sit a little higher. I like to snuggle down when I sit in a, in a seat. Um, you know, the, when you sit in a Range Rover, you sit up high because you can look over and you get all the sight lines. This car, the seat just doesn't, it doesn't go low enough for me. I have a similar issue with the, I, with the Ionic 5, but um, overall though, very comfortable car. I think the cabin is great. It's ergonomically when you, you have your, your um, arms on the center armrest, you can keep your arm on the, um, on the, the, the lower armrest on the left is good. 
um, or you can have it up here. So it's all good. Let me jump into the back, see if I fit here. This will be fun. Ah. Okay. All right, my leg didn't get crushed that time like it did in the Q4. I have more, more um, let my feet go further underneath the front uh, of the, the front seat. This, this back seat, I can tell you that it does recline, which is good. Um, and I've got headroom, but the problem is this thing right here, when I put my head back, I'm hitting into it. So I've got headroom, but if I angle that seat back in the back, that's not good. And it, it, so the, if I have it, if I have it like that, that's better. I would say this has more room than the Q4 for sure. But again, I'm not sure I'm tipping the Uber driver. All right, let's go over to my old friend, the Ionic 5. I love this car. I just, uh, first of all, everything about this car I love. You approach the car, the door handles present themselves. You just easily get into it. Um, now this model here is an SEL, which means that it does not have a glass roof. But I can tell you, because I had a limited, uh, the glass roof, it comes relatively far forward, but not as far forward as in the Model Y. Um, Armrest is great on the left, armrest is great on the right. The user interface, I love, absolutely love this car. Um, both the uh, Q4 and the ID4 and the all the EGMP platform cars support Apple CarPlay. And I love Apple CarPlay. I love it for Waze, I love it for my music, Spotify and all those things. Um, you don't get Apple CarPlay in a Tesla. So not great. Um, even on the limited trim, you have manual up and down with the steering wheel. There's nothing um, that is power. I will say though, on the GV60, had to throw that in, sorry Kyle. Um, you do get a power steering wheel in and out, which is great again for memory seats. Uh, I think that's a tremendous thing. But this is a, this is a great place to spend time. Uh, the, the user interface is excellent. It has a nice combination of buttons and switches. One of the interesting things is on the, on the Limited, this whole center console actually will, will go back and forth. Now, why would it do that? There's an interesting feature in the Limited car, which for a six foot five guy doesn't really work, but it's kind of got this lazy boy seat in the Limited, in the limited only on the driver's side. I believe in the European specs, the limited uh, Ionic 5 has it in both both seats, um, but this car, uh, it, it, when you have it in the limited, and it's really got a comfortable mode. And if you and, and you pull this whole center console back, you actually can go to sleep in it. And I did it a couple of times on road trips where I was um, I couldn't find a hotel room, and I'm not going to say I would recommend doing that, but it was pretty comfortable. So let's see. Let me jump in the back. I don't think I ever sat in the back of my Ionic 5. So this will be a first. Now, one of the things about the Ionic 5 that's great is you can actually, you can actually put the seat, it's on, a, it's on a roller, so you can go, which is which, one of the reasons why that's great is because it gives you more room in the back when you want to pack things. But what's also good is you can actually put it all the way back and then you can also angle the seat back quite a quite a far ways so again now honestly I've, I don't think I ever sat in the back seat this works this I mean seriously I'm surprised another nice feature on the uh, the Ionic 5, I, I can't remember on the Y, there's rear air conditioning. I believe that it is on the Y. I can't, I don't remember if it's on the ID4. It is on the ID4 and the Q4 in the center console. The Y has it here too. The Y has it in the center. But you know what's nice about these EGMP platform cars is they have the, they have the AC on the B pillars, which is great if you have a dog. They're a little higher up and, um, and that works. So did I miss anything here? I don't think so. 
uh, you know, a couple of cup holders, standard, nothing great, but, uh, but this by far is the most comfortable that I've sat in, in the back. All right, I didn't know I was gonna get a workout today. You know, I mean, all right. It's a good thing I get union rates, you know what I mean, Jordan? So, now, the weirdest thing about this car to me is the way you open it up. I don't know, you got a button, and then there are these little prongs that push the door out. I, I wonder what would happen. You know when you get those ice storms, Jordan, yeah. and, and it, it kind of like freezes up the door? I wonder what would happen with that. Um, so I've got this seat. All right, so this is a GT model, performance model, and I can tell you that the seat is much more comfortable in this car than it is even in the regular GT. I've driven both. And uh, you have four window switches, uh, the UI, it's, I don't know, to me, this seems like a little bit of a, it's fine, it's a tack on, it looks like a giant iPad that's tacked on. I know the Model Y looks the same way. A lot of people, it, it's a great, a great space, real estate space wise. But what's interesting is they put this dial here in the center, which is, yeah, which is, which is pretty interesting. The, the fact is that you do have a center, uh, a little console in the center for the UI, which is good. And I would say that this is very comfortable. The glass roof is smaller, much smaller than the Y, having just sat in it. But I have plenty of headroom. This is very comfortable. The ride with this Magna ride, specifically in the GT Performance Edition, is worth every penny, in my opinion. It's not really that much faster, but uh, the seating materials are, are much nicer. I like the use that they have on, the, on the, the dash, and it's kind of like a, I don't know what you call that, it's a fuzzy, that's called fuzzy stuff is yeah. what I call that. And uh, it's, it's quite nice. So let me jump in the back seat. All right, now this looks like it's gonna be, uh, all right, I'm in. Okay, my knee and leg, I might need surgery. I, I don't know, ah, ow. Okay, now granted the seat's way back because I'm 6'5". Um, headroom, but only up to a point where I am smacking my head into the back of this thing. Headrest is nowhere to be found. I don't know if this seat reclines or not. It doesn't go forward or back. I would say, I don't know, not great back here. I think I would pay the Uber fare, but not tip. For sure um this is tight yeah the glass roof stops where the model y it continues the model y continues back but i'm in, a, in an accident i think this is dangerous now if i slide forward if i slide my butt forward and i shut the door i'm really going to injure my legs like no joke it's going to pinch between the seat and the door and that would that would not be good so um i would give this maybe a c minus in the back seat ah uh, the id4 I've never driven one of these before. <laughs> I've owned three of them. This is an all-wheel drive Pro, not an S, which means there's no glass roof. Uh, love these ID4s. And I also hate these ID4s. Hate's probably the wrong word, but there's a few things that I think uh, leave a lot to be desired. The first is the UI. It's glitchy, it's slow, maybe the newer versions have, have, have actually been delivering. But the, the app on the phone, I can tell you that 50% of the time, you, when I would try to warm up my car in the winter time, it would just not work. It would fail to connect. Tesla, the app is just insanely good. Everything just works with that every single time. Now I can tell you, I've, I, we just recently got the GV60. The Ionic 5, it worked every time. The GV60, it works every time. You can do things like turn on the heated seat, turn on the heating steering wheel. The ID4, they need to get their software guys talking the same language. I do kind of like the, the uh, I remember this now going back, it's kind of like the ID, the i3, you know, I love that, that the way of putting the car in gear. Um, this, the, I read somewhere recently that I'm a big guy, 6'5", I'm kind of wide. When we would go on road trips, my wife and I in this car, uh, I would put my, my arm not on this center, 
this, this armrest. One thing you can actually raise it and lower it at different heights, but there's nothing in between. And so I would always end up putting my, my, my right arm over on the, on Kathy's, uh, my wife's uh, armrest. And, and I, I read somewhere that the 2023s or maybe the cars that are coming out of Chattanooga, they've, they've actually changed this now, which I think was, is a good, is a good move. The steering up and down, even on the, uh, the S model, I can tell you that the, the glass roof in the, in the S is, um, is quite nice. I can't remember how far forward it goes, but it wasn't anything to write home about. Um, this is the problem. You get two window switches in this car, and I know it's a stupid thing, but if you hit that rear button and then you push down, you're gonna, you're gonna put down the rear window. I mean, what was, what was the engine, who at Volkswagen said, we can save money by only having two window switches. I, I just don't understand that. Put four window switches in it, please. Maybe they did for the 2023s. Um, I know a lot of people complain about the piano black. I know it, it's, there's a lot of piano black even in the Q4 e-tron as well. It kind of looks cheap to me. Some people like it, some people don't like it. Um, the UI relies very heavily on haptic buttons in this car. One of the things that I found um, actually, I don't know if dangerous is the right word, but you see the set button right over here. Um, you, you know, one thing that is nice is that when you are using the ADAS system in this car, instead of it having a torque sensor on the wheel, it is haptic. So all it has to know is that your hands are on the wheel. You can just squeeze the wheel a little bit and it senses you. But if you touch this button here, which is not a real button, it's actually haptic, that will set the cruise control. And, and it happened to me a couple times and I didn't realize that it actually, the cruise control was on. And I was just, you know, and all of a sudden the car just started to accelerate. Now, the good news is that the ID4, even in the base trim, uh, it, it comes with a, a large array of safety features, including lane keeping, uh, highway driving, and it's pretty good. It's more of an assist than the Tesla system. And I would say that the uh, EGMP platform cars are better in terms of when you get into some real tight turns and things like that. But, um, but the base model ID4 comes with adaptive cruise and lane keeping. And I just looked at the sticker on that Q4 e-tron, which is 57 grand. And that thing does not come with adaptive cruise or lane keeping. I may be wrong, check that. But if that's the case, I think that's, that's unacceptable for a brand like Audi to come out with a car that you have to pay to get adaptive cruise. In 2022, are you kidding me? Let me jump in the back seat here. <clears throat> Not bad. Not bad. I would say I'm, I'm not hitting my, I'm brushing my hair up against the roof line here. Um, I don't think that this car, this, no, there's no angle in back. There's no sliding forward and back. This is acceptable with the seat. Again, the extreme case of me being 6'5", sitting in the front, sitting in the back. So for most people, it's going to be fine. But uh, this is acceptable. I would go on a road trip uh, if I didn't have to chip in for gas. So this is acceptable to me. All right. Jordan, I'm getting tired here. And the good news is this is the last car. So we've got the, the Kia EV6. This is the wind edition, no glass roof. Um, door handles will present themselves. It, 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 if the car is locked and you have the key on you, uh, it will, they will pop out. Unlike the Model Y or the Model 3 where you have to actually physically touch them. So, oh, is that right? Yeah. So the wind is different from the SEL and not the so here you have to push in just like on the Model 3? Yeah. Well, you can't get the wind then. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, do not get the wind for that one feature. Uh, okay. Very familiar here. One thing about this, this is a um, supposedly the more sporty uh, version of the car. You'll notice it's got a curved dash or a curved UI. Let me put this thing on. Uh, what are you doing? Oh, over here. Um, the, Kyle is the key. Oh, Kyle is the key. <laughs> That's all right. It's only 95 degrees out. Uh, four window switches, plenty of headroom, no, no glass roof. Um, the, the center console, it, it has room underneath it, which is, which is good. Um, but, and, 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 but it, it's, it's definitely somewhat more much like the GV60, 
the the Ionic 5 has a much more open feel to it, especially if you can slide that uh, center console back. Not that there's anything wrong with this. This is just a different feel. It's amazing that one company on the skateboard platform has been able to come up with three completely different look cars and also the interiors are completely different. The use of materials in the wind, it's good. It looks okay. I mean, nothing great. I've seen the GT line as well. It's much nicer. The seats are nicer in the GT line. Although I like these headrests. They're, they're pretty cool. Although they, they kind of make me think I'm at the dentist, which scares me a little bit. So I, I don't know, maybe that's just me. What did I miss here? UI, it's the same as the same as the Ionic 5. But you get USB-C in this car, not in the Ionic Yeah, 5. you know, okay. <laughs> All right, so everybody, you know what? <laughs> Whoever buys an Ionic 5 that needs a USB-C, write me an email. I'll, <laughs> I'll buy you a $4 adapter, all right? All right. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, my feet don't, don't really even go underneath the front seat. And I have no headroom. I mean, like seriously, bad. Now, hold on. How do I, oh, I know. You gotta angle the seat back here. Okay. If I angle the seat back and, and I lean back, it's acceptable, it's tolerable. But the way, when you look at the car, the way the roof line goes on this car, it's definitely costing some, some headroom if I sit up straight. I am jammed. I'm wedged. I, I don't know. I like the fact that you can actually, can you, so the Ionic 5 is the only one that you can actually move the seat forward and back. I understand why you can't do that in GV60 because you got a four, four, four or five inch shorter wheelbase, but I would have thought in the EV6 you'd be able to wheel, you know, have the seat go forward and back. Um, oh, there's a USB-A port here on the side which is interesting. So anyway, there you have it, folks. Um, I would say, Jordan, remind me, which one's the clear winner? Hey, you gotta, I forgot what I said, so you go back and watch the video. <laughs> Thanks for sticking with me here. Hopefully this has been helpful. So I'm gonna briefly just walk you through all the driving dynamics, how they feel to drive, my impressions of them, but I have and will have in-depth driving reviews of all of these. I think I actually already do on all of these and Q4 will come at some point. So let's start on the end and we'll just work our way down the line like we have been. So driving impressions not while driving. We're just running out of time. We got stuff to do. I got to range test this car, the real important nerdy stuff I got to get to. Uh, this one, dual motor, all wheel drive, prioritizes rear motor, bias 150 kilowatt on the rear, 80 kilowatt on the front, about 300 horsepower, rips pretty good. The problem with this car is it doesn't give you full power unless you're above 80% state of charge. Audi also says don't charge it above 80% state of charge because it's bad for the battery pack. So it's like, to get most performance, you have to full charge it, which is hard on the battery. And it, I think it's a conflict of stuff going on here. Um, but in terms of, of ride, very soft ride, um, pretty refined, not quite full size e-tron, not even close. Uh, the brake pedal's very squishy in this car, it does a blend of regen into friction braking. But overall, I'd say it's a very German drive. You go up a back road, it's soft, but it's very composed and you can certainly have some fun in this car. It will rotate on power. You can slide it around. Like the, all the dynamics, if I were to list them out, all really good things. But again, it's a little bit soft and squishy, but honestly, it drives identically to ID4. There's not much difference there. Model Y, my biggest problem with this car is it's so harsh. This thing is bumpy. You hit the bumps and you feel them. I don't know why they have to be so stiff, especially in the dual motor configuration. It's also only a $4,000 upcharge to get the performance. And if you're already in for 65, just go up and get a Model Y performance. But then you get these huge wheels that I don't love. So I would get a Model Y performance and then put Martian wheels on it. Um, if the price differential was any bigger though, there's not real much of a need for the more power and the performance. The dual motor, plenty fast, great steering in this car from a performance standpoint. This is probably the most composed out of all of these, I would say actually, even including that the Maki is the GT performance. This to me is the best driving car from a 
fun perspective and just being actually a pretty quick car. For daily driving, a little bit too stiff, steering's way too quick, and I actually don't prefer to drive this car daily. The car that I would probably prefer to drive every day would either be the Audi or the Volkswagen. I just love the way those, that suspension's calibrated. The Ionic 5 is super grown up in the way it gets down the road. Really nice, uh, especially in the all-wheel drive configurations. Quite fast, pretty good steering. I don't like the seating position for me personally. I sit a little bit too high, uh, but you can certainly slide it around. Like if you want to go have fun in a back road, pretty good here. Good thermal longevity from the drive systems before they derate due to overheating. A very positive driving experience in this car. Mustang Mach-E GT Performance Edition, awesome. But again, this one's really expensive. I think if you go for lower trims of the Mach-E, it's arguably the worst, at least in my impression. It's very slidey, very oversteery, very like bicycle tires. That's how they get the range on the thing. Uh, and it's just not composed. Uh, but when you jump up to the Mach-E GT Performance with magnetic ride control, with these meteor tires on it, this thing's actually really awesome on a back road. I have a whole video review of this and the extended range all-wheel drive, and you'll just see the total difference of my impressions. I'm just having a blast in this car. It's truly quick, and um, but not the best thermal longevity from the drive performance when we're talking for real track use or hard canyon blasting. Overall though, I think most people won't run into these issues. If you go for a max out trim, totally fine. The standard car is super bouncy in the rear end, just not controlled. And my impression is it's actually kind of aggravating to drive a standard Mach-E around. The ID4, similar to Q4 e-tron, soft, squishy, competent, but everything feels intended. Everything you do with this car is like, yep, some German dude spent way too long making this feel right. And that's the impression I get every time I drive this car. It's the, like the inputs are great. My only issue with this entire car, same with Q4, is the brake pedal. Just don't like the braking feel. I think they really messed up how the brakes should feel in that car. And EV6 is just like Ionic 5, but even a little bit more fun, a little bit more sporty. And now you can get the EV6 GT that just shreds. My mom drives a GV60 performance with drift mode and all that stuff, same platform and same as EV6 GT and just seems like an absolute shredder. So I would say for daily driving, for comfort, for around town use, if I didn't have to DC charge very much, I'd go ID4 personally. I don't think I'd spend the extra money for the e-tron. Uh, and then if I wanted to go up and have a blast on a back road, probably the Model Y. Elon said Model Y should get track mode at some point. It hasn't happened. I really hope it does. I should also mention the XC40 recharge, which is still over there, um, and say that that car drives great. Amazing thermal longevity from the drivetrain. Really fun to toss around. Actually like a silent shredder. One of my favorite electric SUVs to drive as well. Uh, but I think I'd still take the Model Y for a performance back road blast. And now it's time to wrap up the video with my final thoughts on all of these cars, because like I mentioned, there's not a winner that we can objectively say without doing all of the testing and everything. And each one of these cars is better in a different category than others. I would say really the weakest link here would probably be the Q4 e-tron, because I don't think that has its own character, its own personality. It's a little too much like ID4. But let me walk you through who I think these cars are for and what I think they're great at. The Model Y is just a clear winner for people who want the best charging infrastructure, the best powertrain control, the best app integration. And honestly, it's an easy buying experience. You buy your Tesla on your phone, it shows up the dealer, you pick it up, great. Quality issues have been very good on new ones. This one's actually really bad. You can see these panel alignments. This car's not been crashed. Totally off here totally off here. The trunk doesn't line up on this car. This is two years old now. The new Model Ys that I've seen have been looking great. I'm looking forward to driving an Austin built Model Y soon with the 4680 pack as well. That's just like the go-to. It's the benchmark. I think it's still the benchmark. And if you just want the easiest ownership experience, you go Tesla Model Y. I don't think you can argue that. If you want to have I think the coolest looks, sort of this Tron vibe, incredible charging, a lot more space than EV6. If you have a family, you, this is my colleague Zach car. He normally has a roof box on the top. You can't go wrong with the Ionic 5. Next generation tech available today with really cool styling. There's a reason these are so desirable and I could not recommend this car enough. But again, this is for the guys who like to shoot in manual mode on your cameras. If you want ultimate control, you go here because it does require a bit of work on the driving side to get everything out of the car. 
The Mustang Mach-E is a clear winner for people who want to drive an American brand that's not a Tesla, to be totally honest. I know so many people that either hate Elon or hate Tesla for whatever reason, and they drive this car. My friend Brian's one of them. He's got a Mach-E because he hates Elon. I'm like, I don't know. I, I, I separate everything out. <laughs> I also don't hate Elon. But I think, uh, you know, Mach-E is just an easy choice. It's a big car with plenty of range. So if range is your concern, this might be the way to go. Um, it charges okay, but not great. It drives okay, but not great unless you get the GT Performance Edition. And to me, it's probably the least desirable of all these. I hate to say it, but I think it's the one I would choose last personally, but some other people would choose it first. I'm just totally being honest here. It's got a big front trunk. It's got a big rear trunk. I think Ford chose the right car to electrify. I think putting a Mustang name on it was the right thing to do to cause controversy. I think the car is impressive. It just doesn't appeal to me very much. It never has. Um, but I think I can give it an objective review and say it's a great car for certain people who want the big range, big space, and an American car, although it's built in Mexico, but okay. Then you get the ID4, which actually can be built in America. And this is just, I think, the happiest car here. It's got the personality. I think I called it the happiest car on sale when it went on sale, and I still feel that way. You can get cool play and pause buttons as an option in the pedal box. You get an amazing options, options list uh, as standard, like lane centering, forward collision warning, adaptive cruise control, pretty good, everything else, the interior's nice, all for like 37 grand and built here in the US. To me, you just can't go wrong with one of these. Certainly it requires a little bit of work on your side to you know, find the charging stations and do all this stuff. The car's not totally optimized like the Model Y, but um, this one, there's just something so cool about ID4 that I really, really do like. And so I've always liked it. I still like it. And then EV6 is, um, to me, not a consideration because I would just go Ionic 5. Same thing underneath, a little less range, more space. Although I know plenty of people that are just like, this is the better looking car. To me, it's not, um, but it's more styling. It's got a much lower roof line. It's more like a wagon, if you will, than it would be a small SUV. And it's cool. I could never, uh, you know, I see EV6s all the time. I'm like, thumbs up. People love their cars. I love it too. For me, on this chassis, I would go Ionic 5 personally, but I don't think you can go wrong buying an EV6. And man, you just get great range, especially in rear wheel drive. You get huge charging speed and for some people, great looks. So that's a great option. And the Q4 e-tron is the tough one because it's actually less of a value as ID4. This one's $57,000 as tested and it doesn't even have adaptive cruise control, whereas this does at $37,000, $20,000 less with more stuff in it. Better sound system in Q4. You get a moving sunroof. It's like an overall, it's a, should be a nicer car, nicer place to be. No massaging seats. You get those in ID4. So for me, Unless you're like, you got money and you want to max out a Q4 e-tron, that makes sense. But to go base e-tron or like a nice ID4, I'd go nice ID4 all day long. You're not gaining anything in terms of range or charging or driving dynamics. And then it's just like, oh, you bought the Audi because it's got more plastic on it and it's an Audi. Some people are just Audi drivers and they would go for it. So again, not a bad car. I just think the ID4 is a significantly better value for the same package. And the ID4 has got more space, at least to me, seemingly more space on the inside. So that's who I think the cars are good for. If it was me, if I was buying one of these with my hard earned money and I just, you know, what I do, which is a lot of road tripping, things like this, I would consider out of all of these personally, the one that has my heart is just the ID4. I just love driving it, just drives right. Um, and I wouldn't, you know, let's just say I don't do a ton of road trips. I just charge at home. That's fine. So. ID4 has my heart, I think. What do you think, Jordan? What would you go for? EV6? You're an EV6 guy. Ionic 5. Ionic 5, really? Okay. That's a very close second, yeah. but so is the Model Y. And if you're me, then you would just get them all, right? Exactly. <laughs> Six car solution. Six car solution. <laughs> okay, well, there you have it. I think you can't go wrong with all of them. They're all really good. It's such a competitive segment. We're just, you know, picking at. I don't even know the words anymore. It's hot and we got to film for the rest of the day. So we'll end it there. All are great choices. Can't go wrong with any of them. And um, there you have it. These are all the hottest cars in the market. XC40 Recharge over there. Thanks to that guy for bringing it to the wrong parking lot. And uh, thank you all for watching another Out of Spec Reviews video. I know this isn't like a nerdy one with all the testing, but hopefully this helps through your thought process if you're thinking about buying one of these cars. Enjoy the rest of your day. 
See you on the next one.